Hello and welcome to this video which is 100 of your questions on paper 1. Let me explain how the video will work. I'll go through the questions in order. So we'll start with question 2 because question 1 everybody can do. And I'll timestamp them in the description below so you can get to the question you want. We'll briefly look at what the question asks. Then I'll look at a question posed by a viewer. And then I'll find the answer from the advice that I've written in my guide to the English language exam brought to you here for free. So we'll do questions two, three, four, five, and then general questions about the exam. Let's get going. OK, the bits in yellow are the bits that will be the same whenever this question is asked, even if it's in 2022. So you will always be told that you could write about the three bullet points. These will always be the same. You must write about quotations, words and phrases. You must write about the language features and techniques. And you don't have to write about sentence forms. OK, so that's um, new, really, from last year. The exam board have decided that students are writing gibberish when they write about sentence forms. So now you only could write about them, but you don't have to. So Georgia asks, what does it mean by sentence forms for question two of paper one? Well, first, you can ignore that. But secondly, one sentence form that you will always get is a complex sentence involving a descriptive list. And your job there would be to write about that list to show the effect on what the reader thinks or feels, preferably what the reader thinks. Question two. Mia Thompson says, uh, should we speak about sentence forms or not? Um, and as I've shown you, you don't have to. The word could in this question, but not in all the others, is true. It means you don't have to. Sana asks, uh, question two and question four, I find are very similar. Do we answer them without writing the same thing in both questions? Well, if we go to the first sample specimen paper, we can see that you're directed to lines 8 and 18 for question 2. And in question 4, you're directed from line 19. So that should answer your question. The question 4 will never ask you about the same part of the text. So no, you will never overlap what you've written in question 2 in question 4. At least, you won't ever use the same quotations. However, you might have formed a similar impression of the characters, for example, uh, or how the writer has used it. You might be saying, you know, that they continually use metaphor or whatever technique you've got. And those techniques might also be in question two. Piers Hamilton asks, how much would you suggest writing for the eight mark question, as in how many paragraphs? So I've got to really correct your thinking here. This is probably the most common question that I got about every question. So I need to answer that by telling you a little bit about the timing of the questions. Now the timings that I'm offering you suggest that you get one and a half minutes per mark. So question one is worth four marks, you get six minutes. Question two is worth eight marks, you get 12 minutes. Question three is 12 marks, you get 18 minutes. Question four is 16 marks, you get 24 minutes. Question five is 40 marks and you get 45 minutes. Now, what I've assumed here and what I recommend is that you don't spend time reading the paper first because you simply won't remember what you've read. Instead, you include the reading in the time for each question. Now, what matters here isn't how many paragraphs you write at all because you're just trying to do your best in the exam. So your only tactic here is to use every single minute on the question. So when you're on question two, you spend 12 minutes on it. If you can only write one paragraph in that time, fair enough. If you can write six paragraphs in that time, fair enough. Why? Because you're after every single mark that's going. And the danger of, if I said, right, just write three paragraphs, you go, boom, OK, here's my three paragraphs. One of them might not count. You might not have made any points that score in that one paragraph. And my advice would have led to you getting lower marks than you deserve. But my advice to always use every single minute on the question will always get you every single mark you could. So do not think in terms of paragraphs. Think in terms of time. 
And then the extra bit of advice that's super important is if you imagine these eight marks, the first three marks are easy to get. You can get them in the first two minutes of the question. The last two marks are really hard to get, and you might spend ages trying to get them. So, never spend more than your time, because if you, if you borrow some time from this question, for example, to try and get the extra mark, well, actually, you would have got the first three marks in that time on the next question. So it never pays to run over your time. You need to memorize these times. I'd actually write them down on the paper. And what I'd even train myself to do is then write my finishing times for each question on the paper as soon as I open it up. So I know when I'm going to stop each question and move on to the next. Joshua asks, what do you do if you get stuck and can't find any techniques? Uh, well, that is a problem. You've, uh, if you can't find any techniques, uh, maybe this is panic because you've been doing English for years. You ought to. I've put in bold the techniques which will always pop up. Okay, you will definitely get at least one of these in, in, in probably all four. I would say you'll definitely get a simile. You'll definitely get a metaphor. It's likely to be a personification, though it might not be. You will definitely get alliteration. And I'm pretty certain you will also get sibilance. So it, um, these are guaranteed. They will turn up. So you can find them. But the other thing is, if you can't find them, you can still comment about the language. Uh, and you can make up the technique. So you'll simply quote something and say, um, this technique is trying to create empathy, for example, or trying to build tension. So it doesn't have to be a named technique if you're struggling, and then you explain how that affects the reader. So although there are only five questions that you asked, there are actually 12 points that I need you to know. So for question two, you want quotations which are short, individual words or phrases. The examiners like you to name whether the word is a verb, an adverb, a noun or an adjective, but it doesn't really get you extra marks, so don't worry if you can't do that. You will always find that the text that you're given is built around contrast. Juxtaposition really means the same as contrast, and you will always be able to write about why the writer has decided to contrast one thing with another. I've got videos on contrast. If you don't know what this means, just search for them within my channel. You then when you want to talk about the effect on the reader, you're not really talking about the reader at all. You're really talking about the writer's purpose. So the writer wants us to believe that. The writer wants us to think that. And that's where you're getting the marks. You get extra marks by suggesting that this might be an interpretation. So using the word perhaps to introduce your quotation makes your answer seem more sophisticated. Uh, I have two videos on the problem of P paragraphs. If you're still getting grades three, four, and five, I suggest you still write in P paragraphs. That's your safest way to get those grades. But if you realistically want grades seven or even eight and nine, you need to learn to get rid of P paragraphs and write in P sentences. So just go to YouTube, type in Mr. Sally's P, and you can see there are two videos there on how and why to get rid of P paragraphs in order to write P sentences. Right, time for question three. In question three, you'll always have to write about the whole of the source instead of a part. Uh, it will tell you where that text comes from. And this will always be about the structure of the text. Um, it won't necessarily... Um, be from the beginning of a short story, for example, but you will always be asked to write about the beginning of the extract and then how the focus changes through the extract. And then this lovely thing here, any other structural features that you like. So obviously you need to know what a structural feature is and you also want to know how that changes the focus. And then finally, the most important, why the writer bothered bothers to change that focus. Simran Aurora asks, which structural techniques should we talk about? Okay, the examiners are happy for you not to name any of the techniques. You can simply talk about the changes in focus. 
Uh, an easy way to spot every single change in focus, really, is by looking for each paragraph. Every time a writer starts a new paragraph, that is a change in focus. That's what a paragraph means. It's either a change in time, topic, or talk. And they are always changes in focus. And so then you have to ask yourself, well, why has the writer done that? So if you can't name any of the techniques, just call it a change of focus and then come up with a name. You know, for example, by focusing on the character's emotions or by focusing on the setting. Yeah, so you just decide, well, what is it that the writer is focusing on in this paragraph? And you name it that way. There isn't subject terminology that you must use. However, there is subject terminology which you can use. So you will always be able to write about the beginning and ending, and I insist that you do actually, because that gives you a full answer. So the beginning of that um, extract and the ending of it. The ending will nearly always be a circular structure. Now, when I wrote my guide, I didn't know that because I wrote it when the exams first came out. But now that I've seen loads of exam papers, I know that the examiners do this on purpose. They're obsessed with it. So write about the circular structure. And that simply means that something in the end refers back to something that was there in the beginning. Um, and I'm 90% confident that that will come up. Uh, obviously, you're going to use the word focus. I've suggested that every single text you come up against will involve the structural feature of contrast. Now, in, in question two, contrast is a language feature, and in question three, it's a structural feature. That's because it does both jobs. But if you think about, you know, on the one hand this and on the one hand that, which is a contrast, you're organizing your text that way. And because you're organizing it that way, it's a structural feature. Another structural feature which will almost definitely come up, again 90% certain, is repetition. Uh, you will get ideas or words repeated and your job is to say, well, why has the writer done that? And the other word you can always use is climax because everything in the text is going to build up to the ending. The examiners will have chosen it for that reason and therefore you can always refer to the ending as a climax. So these are your subject-specific terminology words which will help you get full marks. How many paragraphs should we write? Again, we get that question all the time. If you didn't watch my answer to question two, you want to go back and see that answer. But briefly, it was this. You spend this amount of time on the question, and when that time is up, you move on. It doesn't matter how many paragraphs you've written. The key thing is that you use every minute to get as many marks as possible. So 18 minutes of writing, whether that's one paragraph or 15 paragraphs, does not matter. The examiner does not have a number of paragraphs in their head that you have to reach. How do we talk about structure? Well, we have to talk about the effect on the reader. Um, and as I've shown you, that's really writing about the author's purpose. So let's imagine that uh, a paragraph suddenly moves us towards the setting. Well, the writer might want us to understand the emotional state of the character based on their surroundings. Or the author might want us to understand the class system that's going on at the time and the power relationship one character has towards another. Or we might get into the setting and the author wants us to understand that this is set in the future and therefore exploring what human life might be like there in order to contrast with what human life is like now. So every time you want to think about the effect on the reader, you're really asking, why has the author made us focus on this particular thing? And it's not hard to do that. There isn't an answer that the examiner is expecting. So the idea that comes into your head will be right. If that idea is in order to interest the reader, it will be right, but it will score you no marks because everything in the text is to interest the reader. So that gets you no marks. So you have to think beyond that. What is the author trying to make the reader think? If you explain what is trying to make us think, you will get the marks 100% of the time. Question 10. Alia Bantaqueen. 
How to write about structure in the structure question if there is not much to write about? Well, there is, because you can write about it every single time there is a paragraph, because every paragraph is a change of focus. Now, actually, you'll have many more paragraphs than you can write about, so you want to make sure you write about a paragraph at the beginning, a paragraph at the end, and then any other paragraphs that you notice in the middle, according to how much you can write in your 18-minute time limit. Wassa! Any top tips and methods to write about in language question three? Yes, use those terminology words that I showed you, and particularly contrast, particularly climax, and that will tell you exactly what to write about. Meredith MacDonald, what are the main pointers and vocab to use? Again, every single paragraph is a change of focus, and I've given you the vocabulary. For the structure question, asked Queen 644, how do you talk about what it suggests, i.e. a cyclical structure? Okay, I'm predicting that a cyclical structure will 90% of the time come up. So why does a writer do that? Well, they always do it to show a character's journey. So this is what the character was doing at the beginning of the extract and thinking and feeling, and this is what they are thinking and feeling at the end. And there will be a slight difference. And so what you write about is how the reader understands the character has changed. That's it. That's exactly what a cyclical structure is for. And that's guaranteed to get you top marks. How the character has changed and how you work that out from this cyclical structure. Tegan says, is flashback a structure? Yes, it is. And if you can spot it, you don't get the mark for naming it. You get the mark for explaining why the author has included it and it will always be about our understanding of the characters thoughts and feelings uh oh steinman on a scale of one to ten how stupid is it to skip question three so if 10 is the highest stupid score i can give it then that's the score i'm going to give it remember everyone in the country sits the same paper so even students who can barely read are still expected to get some marks Therefore, the first few marks on the question are just giveaways that, you know, you can just acquire them as long as you can read. Therefore, even if you've got no ideas at all, you will find your score some marks. So never skip the question. And as you know, the marks at the end of a question are much harder to get. So spending extra time on the other questions is actually totally inefficient. Never, ever skip a question. Uzair S. My question is, how should I look to answer question three if I want at least more than five marks? Um, well, you just need to make sure that you talk about the beginning and the ending, which is the climax, and then at least one other change of focus. Um, probably two more changes of focus. That will give you four changes of focus, and each time you're going to relate it to why the author has done that, that should get you more than five marks. Imgacha asks, can you list a few high-end structure techniques? Well, I've already listed them. Can you remember them? If not, perhaps you need to re-watch the video and take very brief notes. Don't write pages, uh, but go back and see what those techniques were, or I might be nice to you and just put them on the screen here. So there are some things that uh, no one's asked me about, the order in which information is revealed is often important because that controls what we predict. And when you talk about what the reader predicts, that's really what the author is trying to control in our thinking. Uh, so you may well get structural points where, for example, um, a gun might be revealed at the beginning of the passage and we assume that uh, the character is going to kill someone with it, but actually what happens is that someone else comes in, picks up the gun and kills them. I mean, I'm exaggerating for effect, but you get the idea of how something might be planted in our mind only for the writer to then surprise us later on. Uh, and it may be important for us to know something about the context. For example, if this is set in the past or the future, you know, what kind of society is it? And that will control our thinking. So you can write about why they focus on this particular detail to give us this understanding of the social context. 
And finally, in my model answer in the guide, I can see that I also focus on crisis as a keyword. So it's very likely that there'll be some sort of crisis in the passage that you're looking at, and that will be a structural feature. Right, question four will always be on a part of the text, and it will also have a made-up opinion. Student, having read this section, said this part of the text, explaining what Draco is doing, shows how happy and free he feels. It's as if we feel his excitement. To what extent do you agree? Now, the to what extent means that the examiner wants you to evaluate. Now, this annoys me because the examiner's report suggests that you could get away with just agreeing or just disagreeing. However, it is very difficult to evaluate if you just agree or just disagree because the word evaluate means way up in judgment. You know, this is a bit like that, but it's also a bit like this. And if you, if you can't weigh things up, then you can't really evaluate. So I recommend one simple method here, which is that you mostly agree and then find some, some way of disagreeing. Or if you passionately disagree, then find some way of slightly agreeing. The key thing here is that you don't totally agree and you don't totally disagree because then it's really hard to evaluate. And there's that word here in the bullet point. It says you could evaluate, but actually the marks game scheme says you must. So could here means must. Um, and because it's your own impressions, teachers have often directed students to say, look, it's just much safer to agree. Well, possibly, but if you passionately disagree, that's fine. But you have to find, like I said, some element of agreement. You can't have it all agree or all disagree and realistically expect the examiner to say you're evaluating. Uh, so that is my top advice here. Shannon Van Schur asks, what is the key to the language paper one question four? What is the examiner really looking for? OK, well, what the examiner really is looking for is not what's in the statement at all. What the examiner is looking for is what's in the bullet points. So in this question, you would have to write about your impressions of Draco, but not what he looks like. It would have to be what he feels. So the key words in the bullet points are super important. In the second one, how the writer creates a happy atmosphere. So not just Draco, but the atmosphere. It's super important that you focus on that. And then finally, you must always quote. That's what references to the text mean. So you need to highlight the keywords in those bullet points that tell you what to look for. Uh, I'd also highlight in the margin the part of the text you were told to look at, because if you quote from the other parts, you get no marks. Uh, find quotations. Well, that's obvious. Relate the quotations to the keywords in the bullet points. Embed those in your sentences. So this again is writing P sentences. If you're not sure what those are, you only need P sentences if you're after grade seven and above. Go to YouTube, type in Mr. Sally's P and my two videos on P sentences turn up. Uh, name the technique if you can. So if the writer is using a metaphor, say so. You won't lose too many marks really if you don't name any techniques but it does certainly help you because it helps you explain what the writer is doing. Uh, this is really important. Number eight, develop an argument by moving chronologically through the, that should say text rather than test. Sorry about that. So if you develop an argument chronologically, that means in time order, you simply move from the beginning, not of the whole text, but of the lines that they told you to look at and explain how each new quotation adds to the impression you are discussing. Uh, if you can see moments where the stated opinion is wrong, explain these. Uh, they will show you're being evaluative. The other trick to showing that you're being evaluative is to use tentative language. And these words show that you're offering an interpretation which you know might not be the only one. That suggests you're being evaluative. Perhaps it appears and might. In Game with Alex says, can you have conflicting ideas? Yes, you can, 
But you can't just say, I, don't, I can't decide whether I agree with this opinion. It could be this, it could be that. You have to have an ultimate opinion as to whether you mostly agree or mostly disagree. And this phrase, others could say, but I disagree with this because, is actually really useful. So well done in Game with Alex, a really good, useful phrase for students to use. Uh, Anna Malpass, I've answered your question. And hopefully you remember to structure it by working through the text chronologically. Priyanka Lischa says, should we bother making our language sound nice for questions one to four? Yes, do bother making your language sound nice. And by that, I mean just be as formal as you can. Don't start flinging around a thesaurus and using words that you think sound good. Only use words you're confident in, but be as formal as possible. Because examiners are only human, and two different examiners will give you different marks for the same question for the same answer, okay? That's just human nature. So the more you sound like a good student of English, the more likely you are to persuade the examiner to give you a higher mark. And the less you sound like a proper student of English, the more likely they are to give you a lower mark. That might not be fair, but it is the real world. So yes, use the best language that you can, but not words you're not certain of because they make you sound dumb. D star 23 for question four, should you always try to disagree? Um, well, I would give that as my method. I'd say mostly agree, but always find a point of disagreement because that, as you know, shows you're evaluating. Jacob Cato, how is the best way to structure question four for both papers? Um, well, this one was chronologically. Ilian, Ilian, I can't find any arguments against the initial statement. My question is, can I just agree with this statement and explain why? Yes, you can, but in order to show you're evaluative, remember to use that tentative language, perhaps, could, might. Melia Summers, are you allowed to reference other parts of the text? Remember, you will always be given a specific part of the text to look at. And so the answer is you are allowed to, but you will get zero marks for it. Therefore, don't do it. Jess L, does it matter if you include ideas in question four that you have already talked about in question two? That's important. No, it doesn't. You can't use the same quotations, but you can use the same ideas. And what's interesting is now each question is marked by a different examiner. So the person who reads your answer to question four won't have read your answer to question two. So the answer is yes, you can. Uh, <laughs> Labiba, Kawaja, how would you set out your answer for question four? Because that always really confuses me. Well, in paragraphs, it's as simple as that. And your first paragraph will state your point of view, which is, I mostly agree, blah, blah, blah. However, I partially disagree because blah, blah, blah. Esme Beecham, I agree to an extent. Yes, that's a better phrase than the one I just gave you. Um, so that is a perfect solution to what we've just asked. So you can include one example where you don't agree and that would be okay. It will show you are evaluating. Katie Morris, is it more about quality or quantity of paragraphs for question four? Would three detailed paragraphs with good marks on the other question be suitable for a nine? Again, it is not about the number of paragraphs. If this is a question about quality, then absolutely that's where your marks are, and the examiner will judge the quality by looking at your analysis of the quotations. That's what's going to get you the marks. So when you look at a quotation, how well do you use that to back up your impression? That's what quality means here. And quantity is irrelevant. You simply want to use every single minute that you've got of this question. And you remember there's one and a half minutes per mark. So for 30 minutes, you're going to keep writing your answer, no matter how many points you've made. You're just going to keep going until you've used up your time. And then the moment you hit that 30 minute mark, you finish your sentence and boom, you've gone and you're starting the next question. 
So if you don't fancy buying my guide, then here are the kinds of words that you need to know for this question. I'm not going to explain them. I'll let you freeze the screen and go back and read them. Um, but uh, everything that you want for the top grades is on these pages. Um, so use them if you want. And if you don't, that's fine. And I also explain in my guide how to write in P sentences. And you can see that's what the colour points are here. Point, evidence and explanation. And if you read through that, you'll see how these are sentences that have all of P in rather than paragraphs. That's super important for grade 7 and above because it means you just write much, much, much more quickly. And you get many more points for the same number of words, which means you score more marks in the exam. Right, we're going to split question five into writing to describe and writing to narrate. However, there are three different types of question you might get. So one will ask you typically to write a story or write a description. And there will be a picture which will be either attached to the story or the description. But actually you can use it for both. Then the other alternative is that you will only be asked to write one version of a story based on the picture or another version of a different story. So you might not be given a description at all. That has been done in one of the November exams. And then the third and least likely possibility is that you're not offered any story, but you're asked to write a description based on the photograph or a different description. Now, the reason I think this is highly unlikely is that most schools guide their students more towards the description question and therefore this would be making the exam too easy uh, and the element of difficulty is introducing both narrative questions rather than any description. So this is what it looked like on the first specimen paper where you had a description based on a picture or the opening part of a story which is related and you could use the picture to answer that question or not it's completely up to you. Now the key thing that's going to be really really relevant here is the word suggested. So your ideas can be based on the ideas this picture gives you. You don't have to start writing about things which are in the question. However alternatively you could just write your answer based on what's in the picture. Again that's completely up to you. And what I found is increasingly Schools are teaching their students particular methods, um, either to just use the picture and then a few riskier schools, at least they'll feel it's riskier, are saying, no, you don't have to just confine yourself to the picture. You can be more broad. Um, and the real answer is either method works. Um, the problem for teachers is once you get in the exam room, they don't know what you're going to do. So they're really fond of giving you a method which they know works most of the time because that will maximize most students marks. However, for many of you, there's very likely to be a different approach that would work even better. And to find out, you need to experiment in your revision and in your mocks. So at this stage, if you're re watching this just before the exam, I'm going to encourage you to do what you're familiar with and not to change according to what I advise here unless you're 100% certain that I'm advising something that you can do and you do believe will improve your writing. Otherwise, stick to what you know. So in this method, you just start with the picture and say to yourself, I'm not going to do something just suggested by the picture. I'm going to base it on the picture itself. So you begin by writing about the weather and you set a tone there. So whether you want the atmosphere to be positive or negative. You then zoom out to get a perspective that's from the distance. Uh, it doesn't matter what that is, but usually you might look at the landscape or the surroundings of a character, depending on your picture. Then you'll zoom in on three different details and you'll write, you know, at least a paragraph about each of the things that you zoom in on. And then you'll zoom out at the end to create a contrast with what you saw before. That gives your writing some structure. The other thing you'll do is focus on the weather again in that zooming out because that gives your piece a circular structure where you return to the weather at the beginning. And for an extra level of complexity, you pick a character to put in the scene and you give their thoughts 
uh, or memories. And giving their memories means it doesn't turn into a story, lots of events don't happen, but you still have an interesting contrast and an interesting perspective on what you've just described. So this method is, I think, very simple and always works. Now, there are some disadvantages in this, uh, particularly that you don't know what picture you're going to get and you don't know what you're going to have to write in the exam. So you're under a lot of pressure in the exam. So for some of you, this alternative will work. You can say, well, I know that I'm going to write about the weather at the beginning, so I can prepare one or two paragraphs that are brilliant descriptions on the weather. They're the best ones I can possibly write, and I'm going to adapt those to fit the picture no matter what. And the advantage of that is, you know, let's say you're a grade four or five writer, you can easily make sure that your first two paragraphs are grade seven or eight or even nine by preparing them in advance. Then the only pressure you're under is how to fit them to the actual picture you get. So I'll show you a sneaky peek of my brief guide, my short, quick guide to the description. Uh, so there's a potential picture and I show you how to adapt that description to fit that picture. Then there's another picture and I show you how to adapt it to that and another picture and how you adapt it and a final picture and um, how you adapt that. So that's how it works. And your job really is to ask yourself, well, would that method help me? Do I think that would help me? In which case I'm going to try it or no, I'm quite happy in the exam making things up as I go. I'm not going to risk going in with a pre-prepared description. Of course, the other advantage of the pre-prepared description is you don't have to use it on the day. It's there in the bank. It gives you security and confidence knowing that it's there if you need it. Now, a further advantage of that technique is you could also use it if two narrative questions come up because you can easily introduce your story using a description of the weather. In fact, I know of one school that's got brilliant results by training their students to do the story, but begin the story every time with this pre-prepared description. And so they've got money in the bank. They've got marks already at the start of their story that the examiner is going to give them credit for, even if the rest of their story isn't written in anywhere near the same sort of skill. So if you type Mr. Sally's description method into YouTube, um, you get this video coming top, which I'll explain in a minute. But this one that I've just made, improve your description by two grades. And that one explains more fully what I've just shown you. There is an extra step from this. So if you just go to YouTube and type in descriptive method and then press search, which I'm doing now, the second best video on the whole of YouTube is actually that one that I did one year ago. Even though it's only had 11,000 views, it's the very best video that I can give you. And it explains my six camera methods with the introduction of a motif. So although the previous method I showed you can easily get you the top grades, this one has more of a guarantee behind it. So if you're already operating at a grade seven, I strongly recommend this video. So if we go back to a random image, it basically says, look, position six cameras and they're filming at the same time over a period of about 60 seconds. That's important because over 60 seconds, all these different things you're describing won't really turn into a story. Stories don't happen to be 60 seconds long, but it gives you lots of different ways of looking at the same scene. Now, obviously, your camera can be up in space looking down at the town, and then you zoom in on this image. So, you know, you can interpret where your camera, camera is quite creatively. And then the other introduction is this idea of a motif, a symbol or idea that keeps recurring. So, you know, if I was writing about this scene, I might have the umbrella as an image of protection, and this umbrella would keep being referred to at key moments in the description, or I might use the image of the birds and the idea of flight and escape as a key image that I keep coming back to. And by having this motif in different parts of your description, as you keep returning to it, you end up with a more sophisticated structure. So if that interests you, go and watch that video. So let's look at some description questions. Cam Harris vlogs, 
What happens if the images focuses on something indoors where no weather is visible? And just another teen replies with an answer. You can always start with the weather no matter the picture. For example, inside the house. You could have your narrator look outside and describe the weather. And it's as simple as that. Remember the question is suggested by the picture and so there's no issue at all with taking the weather outside. And of course you can be as extreme as you like here. You know, you could start with that image of the old man and decide that in his mind he's transported to a moment in the past where the weather can be what you want. Or he might be an avid reader and he's transported to a different science fiction world based on the book that he's reading at the minute. You can literally do what you want. The examiner does not mind. They're just assessing your skills in description, not whether you have included details from the picture. Ah yes, says JP43, but what would you do if the image was at night? Well, you do it exactly the same way. Now, interestingly, if you want to describe a scene and introduce contrast, what a brilliant way to do it. Describe it at daytime and then show how it is completely different at night. So this will actually help your writing get a higher grade because you can use contrast to structure your answer. And my advice was, you could start like this. She loathed the night and began to paint the scene in daylight so that her mind's eye was filled with vibrant colour. So it's a really easy way to depart from the time of the picture. Charlotte Glover says, should you use the five senses in descriptive writing? Okay, this is a brilliant question because I imagine most teachers are probably teaching you that yes, you should use the five senses in your description. That's because, just like me, they're trying to teach a method which will help most of their students get a really good grade. However, there is one big drawback of doing that. You end up writing sentences which just include touch and taste and smell because that's something you think you need to put into your descriptive writing. But actually, it doesn't really fit the mood of what you're writing at all. And so, on the whole, I would encourage you not to put in the five senses because it makes your writing feel clunky. However, in an extract from my quick guide to description, the Kingsdown method comes up with a really interesting variation on this. And they advise their students always to include a taste, but don't make it something you can really taste. Make it an abstract noun, something that you can't actually taste. So, the moment Hermione entered the room, Harry could taste her ambition. So you can see how ambition is an abstract idea, and the idea that he can taste it shows how strong it is that it even affects his other senses. So that's an easy literary device that top authors will use that you can steal um, to exploit the use of the tenses without making that clunky sort of list of here are five senses I know I've got to put in in order to show that I can use the senses. Fatima Sharif asks a really good question. How much description do you need for a grade nine? Because I tend to overdo it. And so from the tone of this question, I don't think she means I write too many words. What she means is I put in my writing too many descriptive techniques. And the way that I describe that is I get loads of these posted to me every week. And most of them are overloaded with vocabulary that you've taken from a thesaurus. And this advice might feel strange to you, but my advice to you is to ditch the, th the thesaurus. Don't bring it into the exam with you in your head. When you're writing a description, you want to use the best vocabulary you can, but you choose that vocabulary by making it fit what you're writing. That is the golden ticket. If it fits what you're writing, and it makes the reader think in the way that you want them to think, use that vocabulary. If it's just there because you're using the word Zephyr instead of Breeze, then don't, because we don't need to know it's a Zephyr. Actually, knowing it's a Breeze is plenty good enough. In fact, better, because we all know what a Breeze is, and lots of people won't know what a Zephyr is. So hopefully you'll develop a gut reaction where you're saying, yeah, I'm only putting this word in in order to impress the examiner. 
And that's a really strong clue that it won't impress the examiner. It will do the opposite. It won't properly fit what you're writing about. You're just bunging it in in order to show that you can describe with advanced vocabulary. Well, that's not what gets you the mark. Making your vocabulary fit what you're writing so that it sounds true, that's what counts. Kiana Najafi says, what's the main difference between description and a story? Because both of mine they end up looking like the same thing. Right, well, I've partly answered that with the six camera method by telling you that the events that you can have in your description must take place over a period of about 60 seconds. And then no examiner can say, well, that's a story, because even if it feels like a story, you can justifiably say, yeah, well, it's also actually a description because it only takes place over 60 seconds. I mean, who writes a story that long? In this video, Improve Your Description by Two Grades, I do write something that takes place over more than 60 seconds, probably as long as five minutes. But it's basically a description about people in this particular place. So the easiest way to answer the question is to say that if your writing involves a sequence of events that start here and then the events keep moving forward in time to a final event, then that's very likely to be a story. However, if you've got lots of events happening during a similar time period, well, then they're not moving forward chronologically to an ending. They're just happening to occur at the same time. Of course, you still craft which one you want at the end in order to give yourself a structure, but that's still a description and not a narrative. Ultimate Battle asks, well, what if the photo is underwater or just one thing on a table? Now, this uh, comes to you from Philip Pullman, a brilliant author who you must read, and uh, he actually told the whole audience uh, what to do here. So you'd say, the girl strode into the room, picked the vase up from the table, and smashed it against the wall. And then you can write about whatever the hell you like, because you've You've used the thing that's on the table, you smashed it, and now, boom, you're into what you want to write. And I call that breaking the vase, because I imagine a vase on the table, and that's what I teach my students. You can completely take control by taking whatever's in the picture and smashing it to smithereens, and then writing what you want. DS Revision. Remember, you don't necessarily have to stick to the photo. It's a guide if you struggle. Correct. Remember, it's only what is suggested by the picture. Eman22 asks, can you memorise a description of a person to take into the exam? Yes, you can, because there will always be a person either in the picture or that you can introduce into the picture. So you can decide to plan something about a character who you know you want to introduce. Remember, you do not have to do that. But again, it's money in the bank. If you've prepared it and it's in the back of your mind, you can choose whether to use it or not. Mustafa Malik says, can we use your paragraph? So this is a little bit more tricky because students naturally worry about plagiarism. So if we go back to the Kingsdown method where you take the picture and then you annotate around what's in the picture and you just write about what's in the picture, you can still take in your pre-prepared description of the weather. And in bold, I show my readers how I've adapted the original description to fit the actual image. So what would happen if every student in the country read my paragraphs and did that? Well, I imagine that would cause a little bit of a stir. And examiners would ask themselves, well, is this plagiarism or is it students adapting what they know? Now, what's certain is that what they'd find is that when you write under exam pressure, you will change the paragraphs much more than I have. You won't actually memorize as much as I've done here with my copy and pasting. But in theory, you might have an examiner who's watched this video and they might then read your writing and think, oh, you've just stolen that from Mr. Salis. So I guess the very safest route is to memorize your own paragraphs. Uh, you can base your own paragraphs on things that you've seen me write, and then each of you will do that slightly differently. I know of a really successful school that gives all its students the same two paragraphs to remember, and they all 
they all reproduce those paragraphs in theory of course you can't control what they do in the exam but they're told to reproduce those paragraphs in the exam and use them to adapt to the question obviously each student adapts them the same way and none of their students have been done for plagiarism and it's worth saying you know if you're a student who really enjoys writing and is good at it then this idea of having paragraphs um, that you've memorized is just there as a security blanket and you'll probably reject them you don't you'll want to write your own paragraphs at the beginning um, but for others of you you'll think well actually I'm no good at writing I don't feel that I'm going to be able to operate at a grade 7 but if I can write my first two paragraphs at grade 7 because I've memorized something then pff, yeah I'll do that it's really got to be fitting in with what you know you're capable of and what stage you are towards the exam but you're highly unlikely to be accused of plagiarism um, especially if you don't memorize it word for word but you memorize the content and the ideas and bits of vocabulary uh, and indeed the sentence structures Fatima Sharif asks um, how do you use extended metaphors and how do you think of them in the exam because it's quite hard and takes me ages to think well obviously that's going to derail your exam if you spend too much time thinking so I deal with this in my guide to the description question I'll just give you a sneaky peek um, describing the car as a cow isn't going to be that helpful for you but describing the sea as a horse race or the storm as a famous actress will fit nearly any description question that you have similarly I describe a city as like loading a computer in the internet uh, that will be relevant to any question you get the animals at a zoo probably not um, and then I give some shorter ones for an old face and a young face and those would fit any description so what I'm suggesting there Fatima is that you can plan some extended metaphors already and know that you will be able to fit them in no matter what the question is um, you remember you don't have to buy my guide you can get them for free on Kindle Unlimited and the link will be down below I'm not just here to sell you stuff yes Amazon do give me some money if you get Kindle Unlimited but for you for 30 days it's free so I feel quite reasonable about asking you to do that but the reason I've included those extracts in the video is so that you can actually just freeze the screen go back freeze the screen look at those extended metaphors yourselves and decide if you want to use those ideas or not Rishna Gopal Ratnaraja love that name says I want to find out when doing descriptions if you could get a picture of just a person like in last year's AQA exam can you then go and describe the scenery yes you can remember I've told you how you can smash the bars and that the picture is only something that is suggested um, so or you can literally just put the person in the scenery if you want to describe the photo introduce a character uh, into the scenery that you want him to be in or she to be in no you ask what would happen if you would copy almost word for word the extract provided in my videos or my guide isn't that just obvious plagiarism and would you be disqualified so the first thing you need to know is that you would not be disqualified that would only happen if you took some resource into the exam and copied from it or even if you just took the resource in and they caught you with that however it wouldn't go down very well with an examiner if you ended up writing something word for word that they'd already read or seen on the internet so obviously you want to adapt it as you go but the worst case scenario is they'd read it and say I've seen that on Mr Salas's channel I'm just not going to mark that as part of your score I will just mark the rest of your writing so that's the only risk that you run YouTube 2 will you be doing videos on example descriptive writing pieces okay well let's go back to youtube.com which is the YouTube not just for the UK but for the whole universe and if you type descriptive writing into that the top video that comes up is by a certain Mr Bruff and he's got over 200,000 subscribers and half of them have watched his video the next top one in the universe is Mr Salles is one 146,000 views from a channel that only has about 47,000 subscribers and if we go down there's another one of mine there's another one there's another one 
there's another one, there's another one, there's another one, there's another one, and so on. You can see that my videos on descriptions are the best in the YouTube universe. Hurrah for Mr. Sales. And I totally love this about YouTube. It's not like a lesson in class where you teach it and you've no idea whether your students have benefited from that lesson or not. YouTube just tells you the facts. It says, yep, uh, this is the one that we're recommending because of the behavior of your viewers. So I know at the minute, and obviously this could change at any time, my videos on description are the most useful ones on YouTube. And I know that because YouTube tell the whole world that that's the case. So there you go. And I've obviously I do other stuff which isn't successful on YouTube. And I learn from that. I'm not just blowing my own trumpet. I'm giving you the facts. However, it's much more efficient to type in Mr. Sallow's descriptive writing. And then loads of stuff comes up, which is nearly all mine. Some of them uh, still aren't. But I've got examples of descriptive writing all over the place that will get you grade nines. Um, all the time if you could reproduce them. Anyway, there you go. Like, look at this, for example. How to write a short story. It's only got 3.5 thousand views, and I think this is one of the best videos I've ever made on story writing, but I'm obviously wrong because it hasn't had those views. And that's what I love about YouTube. It teaches me to be better. And in fact, this whole video structure based around 100 questions is an idea I got from YouTube it might prove to be a disaster. You guys might hate it. Or it might be brilliant and then I'll learn something new. So YouTube, I love this and I love my subscribers because if they watch stuff, I know it's good. And if I if they don't watch it, I know it's bad and I just have to get better. Brandon Akers for Language Paper 1. Is it a good idea to think of a topic such as an old man prior to the exam and be clear and intertwining question 5 to suit the topic you've chosen? It might reduce writer's block. Yes, exactly. So I call this having money in the bank. So you've planned it, you've got it ready. You might decide in the exam not to use it, or you might think, yes, I can intertwine that perfectly. And in which case, do it. Uh, again, you have to choose based on the state you are in your revision. Don't try something that you think is going to be risky. Only try things that you have a really good idea are going to work with your current skill set. Mina Kauza, hey, for paper one, question five, can you go through a distinct method to guarantee a grade nine description and narrative? Yes, I recommend the six cam method, but Mina says, please do not recommend the six camera method because that just confuses and depresses me. Sorry, Mina. Uh, in which case, use the king down method, which doesn't ask you to use the motif. So you've got the weather at the beginning and the end and the zoom ins in the middle. And if that depresses you as well, I can't help you, sorry. Also, could you share some high-level metaphors and similes that we could use? Yes, I've already done that. Go back and freeze the screen. Or go and look at my videos that already exist. Cho whoopee! How many words would you really write for the Question 5 narrative? I got full marks with about 500 words. Well done, Cho whoopee! Yes, uh, 500 words is my kind of go-to guide. And so in my guide to writing awesome short stories, I tried to make them all between sort of 500 and 700 words long. Some of them were shorter. Um, and so usually they're around 600 words to guarantee the grade nine. And I wrote about 20 different examples. Some of them I, I got fellow authors to write. But so there are 20 examples and they are around 500 words. I do think that is the ideal for a narrative because you need enough going on in order to build up to the ending. That's why the narrative is more difficult than the description question. But if you are a good writer, the narrative question can be more fulfilling and an easier way for you to get a top grade because most students who do the narrative don't write a proper ending and therefore it loses its impact. Whereas if you've got a narrative with a proper ending, it has a much greater impact because it simply stands out against all the other stuff the examiner's reading. Regan Lay. For the descriptive writing, will formulaic answers score as highly as more spontaneous answers? That's a really powerful question, and it's based on where you are at the minute as a student. When I was an O-level student, which obviously 
predates the GCSEs, I had scored the top mark in my school, and it was a grammar school, hooray for me, um, in the story question. I'd written a story in the exam which scored 100% and it was a brilliant story. When I then sat the actual exam paper, I thought, hey, I've got top marks, why don't I just reproduce that story in the real exam, which I did, and I didn't get top marks. In fact, the top mark was an A grade and I ended up with a B. Now, I've no idea whether that was because my answer became formulaic because I wasn't really being creative on the spot, or whether it was the other curse of an English exam, just marked by a different examiner who had a different view. So what I'm saying is I really don't know the answer to that. If I had my time again, because I love writing, I would not have memorised the answer. I would have just made something up on the spot. Um, but that's me now talking as an adult. Um, as a 16-year-old, I still don't know. Uh, so you really have to make that decision for yourself. And the way to find out is to try it. Do a past paper or get your teacher to invent a new question or do it yourself and then write your memorized bit of writing and see if it works. If it works, then it won't be too formulaic and if it doesn't work, don't do it. This leads us to Rasha Rasha, who basically asked the same question. Uh, some teachers Advise to write and memorize, memorize a sample answer to question five. You could therefore include all the techniques that you want it and just tweak it to the actual exam. Yep, that is a brilliant idea, but you have to try it for yourself first and see if you can do it. Do you recommend it? I do if you're not a confident writer, because you will memorize things which are better than your normal writing and you will be able to include them in the exam and get credit for those skills which you wouldn't normally have. Um, so why wouldn't you do that? Uh, I would certainly go for that money in the bank and have it ready to use if you can. Uh, Fatima Hussein asked, should we make a checklist of techniques to include in question five? And the answer to that is no. Don't spend your time writing a checklist in the exam. Oh, I've got to remember to use all these features. Uh, that wastes your time and also leads to clunky writing. If you are going to memorize something, make sure it includes the things that you value and then bring what you've memorized into the exam so that you can reproduce it. But the checklist wastes time and leads to chunky write. Chunky, and I don't mean chunky, I mean clunky. Um, don't do it. Amy Denton, I've already answered the first part of the question about a method to get um, grade nine, but she also asks, are there different techniques and vocab that can be used on the other questions? And I would say no. Um, don't worry about your vocabulary. Well, that's, I don't mean forget about your vocabulary, but don't try and memorize words which you're going to try and shoehorn into your answer. If you're going to memorize anything, make it sentences or paragraphs. The vocabulary mark is only there for vocabulary that fits your answer, and it's very unlikely that you'll be able to make the word that you've chosen or the 10 words you've chosen fit the question so don't do it. Elizabeth Davesy, if you have a question asking you to write a description based on a picture or a story, stormy ocean, can we interpret this abstractly and write about someone experiencing a rough time? To what extent can we interpret things abstractly? Yeah that's really powerful um, and I would say you can do this totally abstractly and there is a slight risk that the examiner will say, hold on, Elizabeth, you've just taken um, a story that you've written before and you've reproduced it in the exam no matter what. In other words, they might not see the abstract connection. So what you do here is you'd say, right, I've got a stormy ocean, uh, so I'm going to give my description a title, which would be uh, stormy relationship. And then your examiner, no matter how um, disconnected from your thought process, will understand that you took the image, which was a stormy ocean, and you interpreted it as stormy relationship. And that simple titling will make sure that you can really write whatever you want, as long as you make a link between your title and the picture. So this is actually another breaking the vase technique, which I love. Sophie Nash says, how much of a storyline action do you need to include in descriptive writing? 
Now this is a really good question because you don't want a storyline, which is why I've told you to try and base the action, as it were, over 60 seconds. However, you must have action because the most powerful part of your writing are the verbs. And verbs demand action, so you must have things going on in your description. That's compulsory. You just need to make sure they don't go on over a period of time, because then it could turn into a narrative. Grumpy Goomba 9. Should you pick the picture or prompt for paper 1, question 5, in general, if you can't decide? Uh, well, if you can't decide, it's obviously easier to go for the picture, because that's got more ideas presenting themselves to you, and so that will be the one that you can probably write about best. That's my guess. Sheridan Povedano. When it comes to the last question, is it okay to write in a very poetic style with different line lengths, like a sort of poem, like description, or would that be seen as weird to the examiner? Uh, now, I love this question. So, in the old exam, I used to encourage my students who were poetic to do just that and say, look, yeah, if you want to write a poem, do it. The uh, only barrier to this is really how much you can write. Uh, so if you can write at least 250 words and you're a good writer, then I would say take the risk of writing a poetic style. The worst case scenario is that you don't get the mark that you want. Now remember what I've said here, English marking is subjective and examiners with equal experience will give the same bit of writing different marks. And simply what you do there is ask for a remark. And because you would have written in a poem, which is unlike the form uh, that most, you know, 99% of students would have written, it's very likely to be looked on favourably on a remark. However, if you're not already a good writer who doesn't already like writing poems, do not do this method. But if you consider yourself poetic and you really enjoy writing poetry, hell yes, do that. And actually, when you think about it, that's a much more genuine kind of writing. No author writes 250, 300, 400 word description in their novels. They just don't do that. It would be career suicide. However, a poet would. So you're actually writing something more genuinely English by writing a poem. And you're getting more skilled at something that's a genuine English skill that English teachers ought to value, for God's sake. So do it. Arian J. I know planning is an important part. What actual key things would you suggest including in plans? Because some people struggle to make a plan and sometimes spend too long on them. 100% Arian, the crucial thing here is how long you spend. So in this recent video, question five description exam walkthrough, um, I show you how to plan using the picture and that literally takes me between one and two minutes. No more than three minutes max because you score no marks for your plan, only for what you write. And you won't have enough time to write if you take longer than three minutes. And the quickest method is weather and the three zoom ins and the zoom out with the weather again. I can't, I can't think of an easier way to plan and it takes the thinking out of it for you. Ha 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 ha. Please, can you do a description of a person just like what you've done in the latest videos about the description of the weather? It would be really helpful. Well, yes, actually. Remember my Amy Winehouse picture with how to write a short story? Well, that's a story that takes place over literally 30 seconds to a minute. And so although it does have an ending and I'm giving it the title of a short story, that would work equally well as a description piece and get you 100% in the exam. As you remember, I think it's brilliant. Uh, YouTube viewers don't agree, um, but give it a go. Honestly, this will give you a brilliant insight into how to write about a character. Or you can go to Amazon, following the links below, and check out my guides, which have numerous examples of character descriptions, which, again, you can get for free on Kindle Unlimited for 30 whole days. O. Steinman asks, do you get more marks if your question five is, like, meaningful? Yes. So, if your description is just there to prove that you describe, 
you really can't really get above a grade five or six max. However, if there is a point to your description, which I think is what you mean here, then yes, you're going to get much higher marks. If you've got a viewpoint, so there's somebody observing this event and it is all this scene and it is an interesting scene to them and they make their interest real to us, that will make it more meaningful. So you've got to have a reason for your observer. And if you can do that, you'll definitely make it more meaningful. The easiest way to do that is to have somebody watching the scene who has a reason for commenting on what they're seeing. Um, there are numerous examples of that, again, in my videos and in my guides. Um, so yes, make it meaningful. Becky Luke, uh, if you get given the option to write a description, do you have to stick to the picture or can you stem off uh, and start writing a story? No, don't turn your description into a story. However, if you mean, can you use the picture to write the story in the story question? Yes. So you can use whatever's in the description question to inform what you want to write in the narrative question, but make sure you're writing an answer to the narrative question. Doodle! I'm the least creative person in the world. What should I do for the descriptive writing question? Well, I think you know by now from my advice, but also this feeling that you're not creative is incredibly common in English classrooms. And what I'd say to you is that that's not true. With practice, you can become totally creative. And the secret is to switch off the voice in your head, which says, no, that's a rubbish idea. That voice is in everybody's head and successful writers learn not to listen to it. They simply write. The time to use that voice is once you've written something, then you go back to it with a critical voice and think, well, do I have to improve that? And that's why real writers redraft many, many times because they know their first ideas won't be the best, but they also know that once they've got that first idea down, they will be able to improve it. So if you're watching this during your studies and not just before the exam, the best advice I can give you is to switch that voice off and practice writing. Just write something that you think might be rubbish and go back to it and improve it. That's the very best way to become a better writer. But it will also teach you to be creative. And that's a life lesson that you'll carry with you forever beyond the GCSEs. So just switch that voice off. Turn it on again when you've written something and you want to improve it. SJ. Can you describe things that you can't see in the picture, like the dirty, noisy city below the clouds, or how terrified the train driver is when the wave hits, or what the girl on the bus is thinking with headphones on, etc.? Yes, not only can you, but should you? Yes, do you remember I talked just briefly a moment ago about having a character's point of view in order to make the description meaningful? Well, what you've described here is exactly how to make your description meaningful. You give your character a reason for describing what they describe. Decky Mans asks, when answering question five, first, can I just write it first in the booklet or would I have to do them all in order? So this is a powerful question. I recommend to all my students that they consider writing question five before doing the rest of the paper. That's when they'll have most energy and question five is 50% of the marks. And I know that nationally, an enormous number of students do worse on question five because they don't give it enough time or they don't finish it, or the questions on the reading paper have made them feel so rubbish at English that they don't put any effort into question five at all. They already feel really low and depressed. However, if you start with question five, you know after 45 minutes, you've already got 50% of the marks. There's still an hour to go. You've still got energy and you think, yes, I'm going to win this. I'm going to attack this paper. So I totally recommend doing question five first. Again, if you've never done that and that doesn't sound like a good idea, don't do it. The time to experiment is before the exams uh, when you've got time to find out if this works for you. 
But the next question is, if you do it in that order, should you just write it first in the booklet? No, you have to write it in the, the question five part of the booklet where you're told, answer question five here. So answer it in the part of the booklet that you're asked for. The examiner won't have a clue which question you answered first and will not care. But they will care if you put it in the wrong part of the booklet. Fatima Sharif. I was wondering if the description question you could use something in the image as a metaphor for a character. For example, if the, ca if the picture is of a worn out building, use that as an extended metaphor for an old man. Yes, 100%. This is a brilliant idea and is a fantastic way to get top marks. James Mitchell, would using a contrasting semantic field get you extra marks? For example, a little girl who is scared of a seagull, so describing the seagull as Herculean. Not sure if this counts as a technique. Well, James, it is totally does um, uh, work as a technique. Uh, we would call it uh, juxtaposition. And if I ran away and looked up the uh, Greek terms for rhetoric, I'm sure there's a Greek term for it as well. But more important than that, it is a brilliant way to write. It plays with the reader's expectations and it is humorous. And it's humorous in a really sophisticated way, especially if you're going to rock out a vocabulary like Herculean. So 100% do that. If this is something that you fully understand, do it. If you don't fully understand this, um, and it's just before the exam, ignore it. Uh, if you've got time, go to the dictionary, go to Google, work out what he means by semantic field and Herculean, and try it yourself. So hamster, uh, what's the best way to end a descriptive essay? Well, that's a really good question, um, because you get marks for structure. Now, real writers don't structure their description. It's just a way to give you more information about a character or perhaps a place to deal with a symbol or theme. There isn't really a proper ending to it in a novel, but you get marked on a structure. So the easiest way is to have a circular structure. This is something that the examiner's report gets very excited about. And that's why the uh, six zooms ending with the weather and going back to uh, the weather that was at the beginning of the question really works because it gives your writing a circular structure. So the simplest way of describing that is to say, go back to something you described at the beginning and describe it in a new way at the end. And that's the easiest way to make sure you've got a structure at the end. Mohammed El Bishari, uh, what tips do you have for using a Homeric in creative writing? So I totally love this question. So Homer wrote many of the Greek myths and... Uh, Really what the question means is, can I use my knowledge of Greek myths in my creative writing? And yes, if you've got a knowledge of the Greek myths, do that. Uh, that is an absolutely fantastic way to improve the illusions in your um, creative writing. If you don't know any Greek myths, obviously don't worry about this, but I do hotly recommend them. So my favourite site is Project Gutenberg which has over 59,000 free ebooks. And uh, so here's one, Homer's Ulysses, translated by Guy Thorne, which you can get for absolute free on Project Gutenberg. Or you can get the Three Golden Apples or Heracles, that's Hercules to us, the hero of Thebes and other heroes. Um, there are loads of Greek myths you can get for absolute free. Or you can go to Amazon and make Stephen Fry even more of a millionaire than he already is by reading Mythos or Heroes, both books that bring the Greek myths to light really nicely. And if you buy them using the links in the descriptions to my video, I will probably earn something like 50 pence. So, hey, give me some pennies. Or just... Go to Amazon by yourself and um, try them out. Uh, Sophia Musabi asks, uh, how can you make your description engaging, not just a list of metaphors, personification and similes? And the easiest way to do that is to actually write your description or your narrative as though it means something to a character. And then the metaphors and personification and similes will have a point. Um, if you don't do that, 
you're likely just to stick in a list and be stuck at grade six at the best. Perry asks, um, for literature, we've studied poems, books and plays which contain plenty of imagery and examples of good crafting, if not actually awesome crafting. Would it be considered plagiarism if I would include some examples in my writing? No, this is the interesting thing. If you steal ideas from good writers, it is called an allusion. It is a sophisticated skill. In the same way that if uh, Muhammad were to steal ideas and vocabulary and characters from Homer and introduce them into his writing, it would be seen as an illusion and a skill and not plagiarism at all. So I would say 100% uh, do that. Uh, also, for descriptive writing, would it be accepted if I wrote my answer as a poem? Yes. Kitty Cat says, Hi, sir. I was wondering if you were allowed to write in first person in descriptive writing. Well, I'm imagining that Kitty Cat has been given the advice by her teacher, for God's sake, whatever you do, don't write in the first person. Teachers say that for two reasons. Reason number one, when you write in the first person, you will be really tempted to have events happening. And when you have events happening, it's very likely that they will happen in a sequence which will turn your description into a story. Danger number two. When writing in the first person, you will write as Kitty Cat, a 16-year-old girl living in England. And therefore, you will be unlikely to use language which will impress an examiner who has an English degree. Consequently, avoid the first person in order not to write in your own vocabulary. So those are the reasons that teachers have for telling you not to write in the first person. However, if you can avoid those two problems and writing in first person gets you really engaged in the writing, then why not? Again, remember, test these things out before the exam and see what happens to your writing. So yes, you can, but I'm trying to tell you why teachers are really reluctant to let students do that. Because, believe it or not, there are only two people in the school more stressed about your exams than you. One is your English teacher, because the whole school results depend on how well you do in English. Um, if you do badly in maths, well, lots of people are bad at maths, at least that's the popular view. And so the maths teacher is not under as much pressure as the English teacher to get great grades. And consequently, your teachers are really conservative. They don't want you to take risks in case this um, ruins your grade and also the grades of the school. And then the second person who is more worried than you is the head teacher, who in many cases will lose their jobs if the English grades and the whole school grades are poor. And that happens across the country every year. It's a tragedy. And I'm telling you that not so that you feel sorry for your teachers, but so that you understand why they are so keen to give you methods and to ask you to stick to them, because they really fear failure. Now, I'm telling you that, yeah, no, no, nobody wants to fail, and that's why you should try these techniques out before the exams. Um, but you don't have to stick to what I'm telling you or what your teachers are telling you. The best way to find out is to experiment for yourself and see. But what you most want is not to rock up to the exam and experiment then, because that's obviously higher risk. OK, we now come to question five, the narrative question. El Martinez asks, would you use the same structure for a narrative piece as for the description? So in my guide to the description question, I talked about two methods, the Kingsdown method, which involves six cameras describing the weather, a zoom out, a zoom in, a zoom in, a zoom in, and a zoom out, or the six cam method with the introduction of a motif. The answer is yes, both those methods work perfectly for the narrative question. And if you want videos on that, type Mr. Salah's Describe Method into YouTube and you get this video, the six camera one method to plan and write brilliant descriptions, which works exactly for the story. And you get this one, description exam walkthrough. And they, they show those two methods that I've talked about. And you will see exactly how that description can also be used as a story. 
Well, Austin asks, what counts as a story? Say if I don't like the picture for the description, could I just write kind of description for the story instead, but for example, have it take place through 10 seconds of time? Um, yes, you could, but 10 seconds of time is going to still be a description. So you can use the picture, but you want to make it carry on over a longer period of time so that it actually feels more like a narrative. Harry James says, can you make a video on how to start your story with the end or how to write a brilliant ending? Well, the key word here is crisis. So type into YouTube, Mr. Sally's crisis story, and you will find uh, videos on exactly that. So this video, that video, this one, and indeed this one, which I keep plugging, but viewers still haven't caught on to yet. The Decimo asks, how would you change your answer for question five if the question asked for the opening of the story? Does this mean I should end the story on the climax? Yeah, this is a really powerful question. So what's happening here is the examiners are thinking, hang on, we haven't given the teachers any good examples of 500 word short stories. Um, that's not really fair, is it? How can students be expected to write a 500 word short story? That's too difficult. Oh, I know. What we'll do is just say, well, write the opening chapter of a novel. Well, that's fine. Thank you, Mrs. and Mr. Examiner. That's really kind. However, if you're just writing the opening of a short story, then you don't really need to think about how that piece ends. And, oh, whoops, what happens in the mark scheme? You do have to plan the ending because you do have to have a structure to your writing. So this is another way that the examiners are trying to help you, but when they do, they actually make things harder. So, yes, you still need a climax. Imagine that you're trying to write the first chapter of a book, and in the next chapter, the reader wants to have important clues from the way that you've ended the first as to what might happen next. Or you've given them questions at the end where they're thinking, oh, what's going to happen to this character now because of the way you've set the ending up? And the best way to do that is to give it a climax. Um, so this question annoys me for that reason, because it doesn't invite students to do their best. Hopefully, you are now protected and can. Megan Smith asks, shall your story be in first, second or third person? And the short answer is yes, you can do all of those, whichever one you prefer. If you're super adventurous, the most unusual is to do it in the second person. Uh, the danger of doing it in the first person is that you will end up writing in the voice of a 16 year old teenager, which is unlikely to be in the, the vocabulary and the style of sentences that will impress a, an examiner who's got a university degree in English. So pick the one you can show off your skills best in is the best way to answer that question. And whichever one that is, do it. YouTube 2. How does your guide to short stories help us? And what questions do they help us with in the language papers? Um, it sounds very rude when I read it that way. I'm sure YouTube 2 didn't mean it that way. Look, my guide to the short story is the only one on the market. There isn't any other one. And therefore, it helps you more than anything else in the universe. Um, however, I guess your, your question is, what's the quality like? Well, go and try it. You can sample it for free on Amazon. Um, or you can get it for free on Kindle Unlimited for 30 days. Um, and in my opinion, it is the best short story guide that, that you can possibly get. Uh, of course, you can't get another one, so that's true. But I also think the quality is really good and it helps you with question five of paper one. But it will also help you, if you like writing, being a much better writer. And that's a gift for life. 42 Atheist Splimby asks, what's the chance of there being two description questions instead of one of each based on past papers? Uh, I totally think you're very unlikely to get two description papers uh, questions because that would be too easy. Um, but you might get two narrative questions. And if you go to my description bit, I've explained how you can turn your descriptive writing into a narrative. Emi Kawakita. 
This is probably a stupid question, but would you ever give two narrative questions uh, or description questions rather than a choice between the two? Yes, the examiners did that, I think, in November 2017, and they gave two narrative questions. I would say there's roughly a one chance in six that that's what they'll do. So make sure you know how to turn your description into a narrative or you have a narrative planned. Zarnex Dighty. What to do if you can't think of an idea for a story plot for question five and you're running out of time? Well, the quick answer is do the description question then. But if that's not available, then stop thinking and just write. And what will happen then is that you'll write something and it'll either be good or it won't be. And if it's not, your brain will go, oh, that's not very good, but I've got a better idea and start writing that better idea and cross out the old one. If you just think that you haven't got an idea and you think, well, I'll wait until one comes to me, uh-uh, you're going to fail. But if you start writing your rubbish idea, automatically your brain will kick in, it will get over your fear, and it will come up with a better idea. So 100% of the time, start writing. Stop thinking. And that will automatically liberate your brain to think, and you will write something good. Lee Irvin, how am I supposed to structure a story? Use exactly the methods that I've shown you with the Kingsdown method or 6CAM. Um, if so, if you don't have a method already, steal those. Most of you won't need a method. You can just crack on, but there you go. How much should you write for question five? So if it's a story, you really need a minimum of 450 words. Otherwise, you won't be able to craft the ending. The examiners don't care how long your story is. Uh, what they want is a story that makes sense and that finishes properly. Wakas Ali says, what's the best way to write a story on paper one question five? Well, I've already told you, but the other thing is quickly. Don't hang about. Does my story need to have a good plot to have high marks? No. In an exam, the examiner can't expect you to have a good plot, but they can expect you to craft a good ending. So it has to make sense with the story and there has to be a point to it. That's what will get you the marks. Daniel Virin. Uh, if the question is set out about write about a time when you felt, do you need to write in first person? Yes, you do. But that person doesn't have to be you. You could invent an astronaut or a, an actor or whatever you want and write in that person. But you would have to write it as I. Nina Saavedra asks, Hi Mr. Salas, in our top set revision, my teacher advised us to base our narrative on one of our 15 studied poems, as it will be something we already have knowledge on in terms of writers' feelings, etc. For example, we had a paper one, question five, on a shared event to do, and we were prompted to base it on bayonet charge or exposure. What do you think of this idea? Well, I think this idea might work. But as I say to any teachers that I train and students that I talk to, try it first before the exam and see if it does work. Teachers are always trying to give you methods which they hope will work for 80% of the students and get them higher marks, which I understand. But for you as an individual, that bit of advice might be rubbish. Just like brilliant advice that I've give you, given you, might be rubbish. And the only way to find out is to try it in advance and see. So if your bit of writing that you did led you to write something that was rubbish, as I suspect it did, because how would you put yourself as a 16-year-old into the mind of a 19-year-old soldier in the First World War? You know, it would be, for me, a high risk for you to do that. Alternatively, if you were really able to get into the mind of um, that young man and write convincingly, then awesome. Use it in the exam. Shia Khan says, Mr. Salles, I was wondering if it is OK to include internal monologues for your story. Yes, it is. That is totally a brilliant way to write. If you know what Shia Khan is on about, then you're probably good enough to do this. And that is exactly what happens in this underrated video of mine. Uh, so this is entirely uh, done as an internal monologue um, with um, 
this character. Do you know what? I've just worked out why YouTube hasn't promoted this video. And it's because of the content. I can't mention the content because then they won't promote the video I'm making now. I've suddenly just realised. Um, that's why it's only had 3.5 thousand views. So this video is brilliant, even though hardly anyone's watched it, because YouTube's not promoting it because of the subject matter. Um, so go and check it out. And that probably means it's disabled advertising on it as well, because advertisers won't be um, wanting to associate with my subject matter there. Intrigued? I hope so. Go and check it. I can't believe I've been such a mug. Uh, and anyway, this story is also in my guide to writing awesome short stories, which did I mention you can read for free using Kindle Unlimited. For 30 days, check out the links in the description below. And how should I try to balance dialogue and internal monologue so that I don't overdo it? And that's a really great question to end the narrative section on. And my advice is limit yourself to a maximum of four lines of dialoguer. I don't know why I wrote that. I'm obviously getting a little bit punch drunk. Uh, but my other advice is zero lines of dialogue also works. Um, dialogue really does tend to interrupt the flow of people's stories. So I'd encourage you to avoid it. But again, if you know you write awesome dialogue, then include it, but limit it to four lines. Now, there are loads of general questions that people asked about the paper, which I will answer in another video. If you have got this far, you are an awesome subscriber and you are bound to smash this exams because your level of concentration must be huge and therefore I know um, your revision will have been awesome and you'll sail through this exam. Congratulations. If you've got this far as well, thank you very much. And you're probably already a subscriber, so I won't bother asking you to do that either. Um, it's been a pleasure, although I'm exhausted and I need something like a protein shake to pick me up. See you soon on my channel.